Welcome back. According to my next guests, the domestic supply chain is at a crossroads. This pandemic highlights how critical and how fragile that supply chain has become and how much it depends on sea transportation. Let's learn more now. Here now, Rear Admiral Mark Busby, Administrator at the U.S. Maritime Administration, and Jonathan Kaskin, National Vice President for Legislative Affairs at the Navy League. Gentlemen, welcome. Thanks very much for coming on the program. Admiral Busby, I want to start with you. How has COVID affected the Maritime Administration, both people-wise and equipment-wise, sir? Well, from the um, organization itself, we actually have been fellow working since about mid-March uh, here at headquarters uh, and have just begun to come back into the building here at DOT headquarters in Washington. Uh, our field activities, our three fleet sites and our gateway offices, that sort of thing, uh, because that's very much hands-on, they have been uh, coming in and, uh, you know, maintaining our equipment and maintaining our ships uh, throughout um, uh, this, this uh, last several months. So, uh, but we've been uh, teleworking, I think, very efficiently and, and uh, keeping, uh, keeping support going to the maritime industry. John, you, uh, John, you wrote recently that uh, the flag fleet uh, needs COVID-19 assistance. What kind of assistance uh, do you think the fleet needs? How would you like to see that manifest itself, John? The fleet itself uh, just needs to grow and uh, I don't think it's been severely impacted in its operations, at least for the United States, because we have such a small fleet compared to the rest of the world. And what we in the Navy League would like to do is to advocate for a much larger merchant marine and be able to support the tenants of the Merchant Marine Act of 1936 that says that we should have a fleet large enough to be able to support not only our domestic trade, but a portion of our international trade to be able to maintain our commerce during all times, peace and war. And I don't think that we have adequate capability in both areas right now. Admiral Busby, what is the state of the fleet and what is the future of the fleet? What do you have today? What do you have in the pipeline? And what would you like the fleet to look like in the out years, let's say five, 10 years from now, Admiral? Well, I would, Francis, I'd answer that by saying we essentially have three fleets right now, if you will. We have the government-owned sea lift fleet uh, of about 61 ships, uh, 46 that I maintain in Ready Reserve Force, Marad, 15 that Military Sea Lift Command uh, maintains for sea lift purposes. Uh, so we have that government fleet. Uh, we have uh, about 99 uh, large Jones Act uh, ships uh, under U.S. flag uh, that, uh, you know, are, that take unlicensed mariners to operate and can contribute to a uh, sea lift mission. And then we have, uh, you know, the commercial internationally trading merchant marine, which is about 87 ships today, uh, 60 of which are enrolled in the maritime security program and receive a, uh, a federal stipend to uh, participate in that program and remain uh, under US flag. So uh, I would say that, that group of ships uh, is about the bare minimum right now that we have to execute our uh, uh, you know required sea lift mission um, and 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 even more so the mariners that crew those ships is is really the critical path and as i've said in the past we are probably short in terms of mariners by by about 1800 people to do a sustained sea lift mission so as john said we we need more ships you know we think we need at least 50 more ships or so under U.S. flag, um, to 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 have a proper uh, uh, support for the for the uh, for, uh, for the government. Admiral, what does that ship distribution look like? You mentioned that you have sh basically three fleets. Fifty more ships should be distributed, in your view. How among the three fleets are they all? Should they all be under uh, your jurisdiction, or do, are they distributed among those those three buckets that you talked about? Now, you know. Uh, I, I would just assume that that uh, those ships be uh, in the commercial fleets, you know, either the Jones Act fleet or the internationally trading fleet, where they can uh, benefit, uh, you know, the commercial industry and and not just be leaning against the pier, uh, like m many of our government ships are ready to serve in sea lift mission. Uh, the commercial ships are out there actually operating every day. They're maintaining a very high state of readiness because they're currently operating. 
and they provide a lot more jobs to American mariners. So that, and that's, that's where they ought to be. John, what's the role in the government to fund those ships or to support the funding of those ships or incent the funding of those ships in the private sector or whatever? How, what's, what does that look like? Well, there are two or three different ways to, to grow the fleet that uh, Admiral Busby is talking about. And you know, one, of course, is to expand the maritime security program, uh, which allows those ships in international trade to compete uh, with uh, their foreign competitors. Uh, the Maritime Administration has proposed uh, increasing the number of uh, ships in a MSP-like program called the Tanker Security Program uh, to help uh, mitigate the shortfall of uh, tankers that would be required to support a war in the Pacific. In those uh, sh uh, ships that Admiral Busby is talking about in the 80s, only six of them are are tankers in international trade, and three are already in charter to the, to the Navy. So the requirement that U.S. Transportation Command had shown uh, an earlier study shows that we need uh, more than 78 tankers, and adding 10 is not going to be sufficient. So what we really need to do is find ways of utilizing the, the tankers that we have in the, in the domestic fleet, the Jones Act, to be able to support the, those wartime operations. With respect to the to the uh, increasing the size of the domestic fleet, um, the Maritime Administration has uh, supported and proposed a program in, in, in the past, uh, and is still ongoing called the uh, the Marine Highways Program. Uh, unfortunately, due to lack of funding, uh, it's mainly been devoted to rivers and sh uh, short distance coastal uh, trades. Uh, there is an option to be able to develop uh, marine highways as originally envisioned to carry uh, uh, trailers uh, along the coast, taking traffic off of the interstates, I-5, 95, and 10. And those ships could be uh, dual use, military useful ships that could support uh, military operations as well as be readily available uh, to support uh, 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 commerce. So the those are the two approaches to expand the merchant marine, both internationally and domestically, uh, as well as preference cargoes. And uh, Congressman Garamendi has proposed legislation called the uh, Energizing American Shipbuilding Act that would require a, a portion of U.S. flag oil and uh, crude oil and LNG exports to be uh, on U.S. flag and some U.S. belt ships. So those are the ways to help expand it. The, all of those programs would require some additional resources considerably more than what the Maritime Administration has been uh, given in the past. And that's one of the things that we in the Navy League are attempting to advocate for, is additional resources to be able to uh, help grow the merchant marine. Admiral Busby, what will your workforce look like after COVID, different than it looks today? You talked a little bit about telework. A lot of agencies are, are considering reshaping the way that they do business in light of this and the, and the success that a lot of agencies have had with telework efforts, remote work environments. What are you seeing along those lines? And, and is there a possibility for a reshaping in the way that you're doing things? Uh, well, good, good question, Francis. I think um, the short answer is we're not going to see much change in the operating side of the Merchant Marine. Uh, we may see some change in how the offices run ashore, uh, the management uh, of the various uh, companies that, that run ships, and and potentially here at uh, at Marad, uh, you know, I, I think we'll probably see a lot more people teleworking. But in terms of operating the ships, I think we're going to see uh, very little change there. I think you're going to see uh, a a more of a standardization of the mitigation. Uh, effects that have been put into place, the use of personal protective equipment, uh, uh, sequestration of crews before they join the ship and after they leave the ship, uh, the deep cleaning, uh, all of that sort of thing, the relief of crews overseas, how all that uh, has to happen. There's a lot more involved in all of that now. But really, until we get a vaccine that's widely uh, in place and, and, and widely available, we're going to have to pretty much uh, do business in that new way, and that's just to uh, put all those new safeguards in place, which slows things down, which makes it more difficult to do crew turnovers, and just requires a lot more resources, quite frankly, to, uh, to execute. 
Admiral, do you see any differences yet in the way that the commercial organizations that you deal with are interacting with you that will cause you to maybe rethink the way that you, uh, that you go about doing things, or rethink your business processes to work with or accommodate or collaborate better with uh, the, the commercial fleet? Well, you know, I'd, I'd like to um, uh, think that, you know, when the Merchant Marine Act of 1936 essentially created the Maritime Administration or its forerunner, uh, the Shipping Administration, um, you know, our, our mission that was given to us by Congress was to uh, foster, promote, and strengthen the U.S. Merchant Marine. And that's exactly what we're doing now. Uh, we're just doing it in a slightly different way and using different tools. But that's uh, precisely what we have been doing throughout this crisis. We uh, have hosted a series of uh, weekly and then biweekly calls with, uh, with all facets of the maritime industry, uh, both domestic and, and international, uh, to hear what their issues were, uh, to bring all the government uh, uh, entities to the table uh, at the CEO and president level. Uh, so, uh, you know, they were high level uh, phone calls. And we were able to get a lot of issues ironed out very, very quickly uh, and help to support the merchant marine and keep them afloat, quite frankly, keep them operating. And I think we've been very successful in that respect. And I'm very proud of, uh, of the fact that uh, up until just last week, there was not a single case of COVID-19 on any U.S. flag uh, internationally trading ship. And we just recently had one uh, last week, as I mentioned, with nine people. Uh, but our protocols that we had put in place uh, in accordance with the CDC and the Coast Guard were brought, in, brought into bear. Uh, those people were isolated quickly, removed from the ship, and an entire new crew was brought aboard that ship. And the ship only lost a day or two of schedule, and they're back at it again now. So I think that speaks highly of the union cooperation, of the ship owners and operators, and of the government all working very closely together in this industry to uh, keep the supplies flowing. John, before we went on the air, we talked a little bit about strategy, and I wonder if you can expand on the concept that you laid out earlier in our conversation on television about strategy and where that strategy should come from uh, so that people, especially people in Congress, can better understand where the merchant marines fit into the broader sea services picture and fit into the broader national security picture to justify the funding increases that you talked about. Uh, thank you for that question, uh, Francis. The, uh, the Maritime Administration, uh, and Admiral Busby in particular, has attempted to uh, develop a, a maritime strategy that would help implement the policy of the Merchant Marine Act of uh, 36. Um, unfortunately, uh, it's difficult to get anything through uh, the administration that's going to require the resources that I mentioned before that are going to be necessary to expand the size of the Merchant Marine. So uh, that strategy turned out to be a, a series of goals and objectives without uh, any priority uh, and, uh, or funding and with a requirement to study it some more. Uh, we really do need uh, a, a strategy, which means it's a, something that has resources associated with it to be able to execute what we need. One of the difficulties we have in determining what we need, particularly for national security purposes, is that we haven't really had a, a serious update to our mobility requirements necessary to support national defense, both because the, the current uh, reserve fleets and the, the size uh, of the MSP program has been sized to support operations that were envisioned in the early 90s, uh, wars in Iraq and uh, uh, conventional wars in Korea. We're now looking at pure competition with uh, Russia and China and a Pacific war requires completely different resources. That's why, for example, uh, this issue that I mentioned before on tankers. We didn't have any real tanker requirements in these previous studies because they weren't necessary. Now we do, and unfortunately, the U.S. Transportation Command and Department of Defense has not issued a study uh, that updates those requirements. Congress has mandated them twice to do it. Uh, the next. Uh, the latest attempt was supposed to have been delivered on the 1st of June. And until that happens, we, it's going to be difficult to develop uh, the strategy necessary to, to, because you need to know what you need in order to determine resources. And then we can go uh, in the Navy League uh, as well uh, to help advocate for those resources with Congress because 
Unfortunately, the, the Maritime Administration has had difficulty within the Department of Transportation to get additional resources because the Department of Transportation is resource constrained because it's not, it's a discretionary uh, department, but it's not in the defense side of the pot of money. And as we have done budget development over the last several years, uh, the national security side gets resources and much of it is, comes from the non-defense side, including the Maritime Administration. For example, last year, uh, MARAD got uh, uh, about a billion dollars from uh, Congress, about a billion, 50 million. Uh, this year, the administration only submitted a budget for uh, around less than 800 million. So it's about a 25% reduction from what uh, was been appropriated this year. So in order for us to help advocate more resources, we really need those analysis and the studies uh, and develop a strategy to, to uh, support it. Admiral, we're almost out of time, but I want to give you the last word. Is there something or some things that you think you or your successor will be able to point to two years from now, three years from now, four years from now, and say this or these things are different? We, we're doing something different now because of COVID. Or do you expect in that, that vaccine post-COVID environment that you described earlier that you're going to transition kind of back to uh, the standard operating procedure at the Maritime Administration? Well, you know, I think the, the biggest thing, at least for me, my biggest takeaway, and I'm hoping that, uh, you know, it's going to, that theme will come through, is just how critical and fragile our um, supply chain is in this country and how uh, much it's dependent upon um, sea transportation. And in particular, for our domestic sea transportation, the Jones Act. Uh, I think it underscores very clearly uh, how important it is to have U.S. citizens uh, in U.S. vessels carrying our domestic goods. I mean, just think of what a situation we'd be in right now if we had a bunch, had to rely on a bunch of uh, other countries to carry our domestic trade, you know, be it petroleum, be it grain and the internal waterways you name it, um, we, we would be in some pretty tough straits. And the fact that we've been able to have control of that uh, supply chain, that maritime supply chain for domestic trade, I think has been critical. And uh, I think it's really going to underscore why we have the Jones Act and why it's important to keep it in place. And I think uh, if nothing else, that's going to be a real big takeaway from this uh, little COVID episode. Admiral Busby and John Kaskin, thanks both very much for a terrific conversation. I appreciate it. I'll wrap up our coverage from day two of NATSEC 2020 Coronavirus and Beyond in just a moment. So keep it right here on GovMatters Conference TV.